So as a quick review, we remember that heart failure is the resulting condition that a patient will be in after they may have experienced a heart attack or have had long-standing heart disease, such as coronary artery disease, or after something like high, or after having high blood pressure for some time. But all of those causes will ultimately lead to a lead to damage to the muscle cells of the heart, and then ultimately a weaker heart, and the heart is unable to perform its vital function of delivering blood throughout the body. But all this sort of stuff is happening underneath the skin, behind the rib cage. How on earth do we diagnose this? Well, the first thing that is going to clue us in to obviously uh, someone with heart failure is a thorough history to understand whether they're at risk for uh, cardiovascular events or they've experienced cardiovascular events uh, before that would lead them to be at risk for heart failure. Then another, uh, the next step would be a thorough physical exam. And as a kind of a review from last video, we're going to, you know, sort of detect heart failure due to the crackling upon inhalation, bulging of the veins in the neck, fluid in the abdomen. Next, what you're going to want to do and to further confirm uh, heart failure is to do a chest x-ray. So we're going to send ray, uh, rays of light through the body and detect uh, what's, what it's passing through and see that and for someone with heart failure, we'll see that there is fluid around the lungs and that there actually is an enlarged heart. Uh, an enlarged heart is uh, a, a secondary effect of the heart attempting to try to pump uh, with more force. It's actually going to stretch, uh, and then it would lead to an enlarged heart. And that's very common to see with someone who has uh, heart failure is that dilated heart. Um, third, we'll, you can go ahead and get an EKG, electrocardiogram, and uh, you're going to see some ab abnormalities. So EKG abnormalities is another step in your uh, making di making the diagnosis. The fourth step is something called an echocardiogram or an echo which is an ultrasound technique uh, that's used to uh, kind of view peer under the skin and uh, take a look at the heart and actually you're able to calculate the stroke volume or the amount of blood the heart is ejecting per beat and in fact with someone who has a weaker heart you can imagine that the stroke volume has decreased significantly so that's something we can confirm using an electrocardiogram and finally, more of a uh, very specific test for heart failure is a blood test for a hormone called uh, atrial natriuretic peptide, uh, ANP. And so those are, uh, that's a, another specific test where if you see that in the blood, then you can in fact know that the person has heart failure. And as I kind of alluded to, this early diagnosis is very important. The spelling there. And we'll see that uh, congestive heart failure that's left untreated can in fact progress. So what do I mean can, it can progress? Well, first a person who may have just experienced a heart attack will be okay at rest. Everything, they're, very, they're, uh, they're comfortable and okay at rest. But upon any sort of mild activity will cause distress. So that could be shortness of breath, fatigue, these mild activity will bring that on and that's not good, that's not, uh, that's not normal. Uh, it could then uh, progress to a point where okay they're okay at rest but any activity can cause distress and that's even worse and finally heart failure can progress to a point where a patient is not okay at rest. And that would re most likely require hospitalization and support. So ultimately we want to keep patients away from option C there and that's why it's going to take early diagnosis and early detection of this of congestive heart failure so now I'd like to talk about how CHF progresses. We'll talk about the normal physiological mechanisms that are activated in a person with CHF that can cause the worsening uh, of the patient's condition. So it's important to remember and a good framework for us to you know, go ahead and discuss these uh, normal physiological mechanisms is how our body is going to respond to a decrease in blood pressure. So as I uh, mentioned in the previous video, due to an insufficient pump action of the heart, 
we're going to have a decrease in the pressure that's generated in our blood vessels, and so our body's going to respond to that. And one thing our body uh, does is it constantly senses pressure. It has pressure receptors in our neck. Our brain is going to sense any changes in that pressure, whether it's up or down, and then uh, act accordingly. And it's also going to detect, detect the amount of blood, so blood flow, to the kidneys. And these are the two main ways that our body is sensing that blood pressure uh, throughout the body. In a normal person, if you have a decrease in the blood pressure, our body, our brain, thinks that it's because we are actually losing blood. Um, it says, uh-oh, we're... If, you know, if someone has been stabbed, you start bleeding, our body's going to sense a decrease in the blood pressure and enact a few things. And what I would mentioned in the uh, first video, we're going to hit the, the body's going to want to hit the gas pedal or use the sympathetic branch of our autonomic nervous system. So sympathetic activity will go up. And the sympathetic activity is, has two main effects. One, as we said, it's going to increase the heart rate. And remember, this is something that I said uh, in the first video as a sign or a symptom. So we'll increase the heart rate, and as you can imagine, if you increase the amount of times the heart's contracting, it'll try to compensate and pump out, pump blood out more often to try to increase that blood pressure. Two, our body, the sympathetic uh, nervous system is going to tell the body to vasoconstrict or constrict the blood, ves the blood vessels throughout our body, kind of tighten them all up, and just like if you had a hose and you clamped down on the hose and you constricted the hose's diameter, You'll, cre you'll increase the pressure in that hose. If you've ever put your thumb over the, the spout of a hose, it'll shoot a faster stream of water. And that's the equivalent of vasoconstriction. You're constricting the diameter of that vessel. So these are both things that, both just normal physiological mechanisms to increase, try to increase blood pressure to combat a decrease in blood pressure. So, uh, and this is normally in response to a decrease or a loss in, of blood. So a decrease in blood volume is usually what causes uh, a decrease in blood pressure. But in heart failure, you have an artificial decrease in blood pressure purely because of the failing heart. So these physiological mechanisms will come in to the rescue and these specific activities on the circulatory system, the increase in the heart rate, and then the vasoconstriction of our peripheral vessels will try to remedy it by increasing the blood pressure and setting it back to normal, restoring homeostasis as we like to call it. But there's a whole another set of monitors and that as a surrogate sensor of blood pressure and that's the blood pressure receptors in the kidney that detect the blood flow of the kidneys and if we have a decrease in the blood flow to kidneys we're going to want to retain fluid so the, the kidney is the place where if we retain fluid we have that decrease in urine production as we saw um, in uh, the last video and this is in order to try to increase the blood volume so as I mentioned just a minute ago, when our, this is a normal response to a loss in blood volume, you're going to want to retain fluid by decreasing urination. And this is enacted by the renin angiotensin system. And renin, uh, renin is a hormone that, when in the blood, it will cleave angiotensinogen, or activate angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1, which will then be activated by angiotensin converting enzyme to angiotensin 2 and the abbreviation we use for this enzyme, the angiotensin converting enzyme, is ACE and then angiotensin 2 is going to have very profound effects it will actually also uh, stimulate vasoconstriction it will lead to aldosterone secretion and which will uh, increase fluid retention so ultimately retaining fluid such that we can increase in, uh, blood pressure so combat the decrease in blood pressure and so these are the things that our body's going to do just out of normal physiological response to a decrease in blood pressure to try to restore it. So let's stop and look at these effects. We're talking about an increase in the heart rate, an increase in the resistance with which the heart's going to have to pump over. That's not good for the heart. The heart's going to have to work harder. We're going to demand more from it. And it's already failing to produce it or to complete its uh, basic functions. Three, we're going to retain fluid. This also can't be good because we're going to have even more fluid backed up in the lungs and the systemic circulation, which is going to increase the congestion, increase the edema, and you know ultimately cause a person's condition to progress. So this is definitely not good for a patient because their own physiological mechanisms acting under the uh, knowledge that there's a decrease in blood pressure are going to do all of these things, which ultimately worsens the patient's condition. And so this is why 
physicians and healthcare professionals need to step in uh, with drugs and different therapies to try to prevent these systems from worsening the state of the patient. So in the next video, we're going to go ahead and talk about these different drugs and talk about the different ways that we can intervene and hopefully help our patients.